Since it's a holiday, I thought I'd do a, a throwback to October 21st, 2021, when I did an interview with Will Bonner and Diego Samper on the Bonner Private Wines Project. They're sourcing wines from the highest elevation in the world, mostly Malbec. I visited there a couple of years ago and there are some of the best wines I've ever tasted. And I wanted to know a lot more about the region and, and how the wines are grown there. And since having visited there, I'm sort of a Malbec head, meaning everywhere I go, I look for the Malbec first before I uh, buy anything else. Sauvignon Blanc, when it's hot out, but uh, Malbec mostly. So it's kind of cool. And we talked to Will and Diego a lot about the region, the Chilkat Valley, and how they're actually functioning as a business exporting the wines from that region. So I think it's an appropriate subject for the 4th of July holiday that is different from the doom and gloom that we've been experiencing over the past several weeks. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you get a chance, go check out Honor Private Wines because I think it's worth it. They're exporting wines from Argentina, but they also source wines from Portugal, Spain, Southern France, and even Napa Valley. It's a worth taking a look and I hope you do so. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy Independence Day and democracy since we've been writing about that a lot lately. All right, thank you and enjoy today's session. Wigan Sessions, uh, surviving and thriving in the post-pandemic world. It's not really true with the Delta variant, but uh, today it's more about the thriving side because we're talking about wine, um, something that's dear to all of our hearts. Uh, I have with me Will Bonner, founder of America's only private uh, wine partnership, the Bonner Private Wine Partnership, and Diego Samper, who is a full-time wine explorer and working with Will on the uh, Bonner Private Wines. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us, Adam. Good Thank you for having us. It's a um, pleasure to be here. Yeah, well. My <laughs> <laughs> pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I sh we should probably toast to get started, right? Yeah. Cheers. All right, cheers. I'm the only one without wine. Oh. <laughs> Well, you're uh, it was a long holiday weekend, Addison. And <laughs> early in the week. Uh, so I wanted to get started with just kind of a general history of wine, um, just to give context. Uh, one of my favorite stories is, uh, especially since uh, we lived in France for many years, they're very proud of their wine industry, um, but they were uh, attacked by a fungi that almost wiped out the entire region of Bordeaux and then was creeping up into other parts of the Burgundy area and stuff like that. Um, and they were actually saved by um, a smuggled um, sapling from the California vineyards and then grafted onto um, some of the, some of the uh, vines that were in the old vine that were in uh, Bordeaux. And uh, the, the California, um, vines were resistant to the, to the fungi that was attacking the entire industry in France. It's a story that French don't like to hear very often, but uh, I find it entertaining. Um, do you have any more insights on, on how, how that came about, what the fungi was? And I'm just interested in the history of wine. So. Yeah, I, I could say a little bit about it. Uh, it's called phylloxera. And it's like, a, it's an aphid uh, that attacks uh, wine grapes. And it was brought over from, you know, indigenous to the new world, indigenous to uh, California. And a botanist brought clippings over to Europe that unbeknownst to them had this phylloxera uh, uh, aphid on it, which then proceeded to devour <laughs> the, uh, the European uh, 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 grapes, which weren't, uh, resistant to it uh, and so but what we've been finding in our in our work is that there are a number of areas uh, that uh, were not uh, aside from California that, um, uh, that were not affected. also resistant to uh, this 
phylloxera and uh, one of those places, and it happens to be because of the, the soil conditions uh, in some cases, and that's the case in, uh, in Northern Argentina uh, where we source our Malbec from, and also on some uh, Mediterranean islands uh, uh, such as Sardinia, we source some wines uh, from there that are also uh, pre phylloxera original um, European uh, grapes. Uh, so yeah, it was definitely a very <laughs> pivotal moment in wine history. Do you have anything to add to that, Diego? Yeah, and I think also Chile has a little bit of that with the Carmen Air, when they always say like, oh, we lost all our Carmen Air and everything. And then Chile says, comes up like, oh, we have it. We have a little bit of, of that left. And, and it's, it's that part of, of the transition of like the old world accepting the new world because they had no other route uh, in terms of winemaking. So it, it made it just like a, we collaborate with each other and we will make better wines from now on. But before that, it was like, we cannot take the new world wines. They are not as, yeah. as at the level of our European wines, especially for the French. So it was um, a moment of being humble and started to cooperate with each other. <laughs> Uh, well, that's good. And that's uh, the birth of the modern wine industry, right? The, the shipping hmm. across seas and stuff like that. Completely. Uh, and the introduction, introduction yeah. of different barrels. It's, it's also a, a different, different woods, the American oak, then the European, the Slovenian oak, the French oak. So we, we just had a full diverse conditions now to be able to explore now uh, new wines. Uh, how do the uh, Australian wines compare? Do they, um, are they susceptible to Fluxera or were they? I don't think they were affected to Fluxera, but they were also a late type of country to start producing wines. Uh, and uh, who was Penfolds, is probably the biggest wine producer in there, with the, starting like around the 50s, 60s. And it was just a full different change of how to, make wines and, they, and again, they didn't have any credibility in the position. So, so when they came into the world, when especially Penfolds with their, uh, I think it's Cask 52, I think is the name of the wine. And it's like one of the most chased type of labels you can, you can try to find uh, of, the, of Australia. So yeah, they were, I don't think they were directly affected, but they definitely were a late bloomer in the wine industry, but they have lots of, of fields producing at the moment so um argentina was relatively late and i do want to get to argentina mm -hmm. we're talking about malbec it happens to be one of my favorites um <laughs> they're relatively late but um I, I believe it was the Mondavi family that introduced malbec to argentina and um and they took the grape from the burgundy valley and it did okay there but it was kind of sour and it thrived in the higher altitudes of uh, argentina that's the way i understand it well, yeah, it, which the Malbec loves the high altitude, uh, which is, is a development that was, you know, discovered by chance. Uh, Malbec is, you know, indigenous to uh, south central France, and it was being produced by the Gauls. And the Romans came in and they, they tried their, um, you know, grapes that they brought with them, which didn't do very well in this area of France around Cahors. Uh, where they produce Malbec today. Um, and so they, so basically the Romans found, you know, found out from the, from the Celts, from the local Gauls that this, this grape does well in this area. And so they started planting it everywhere. And eventually what's really interesting is the, is just the, the track, the course of wine growing through the, as through the evolution of, of civilizations, you know, starting it, it came from the Caucasus region and, and originally like 10,000 years ago, and then came down through Mesopotamia, through uh, uh, Lebanon and Syria into, into Babylon, and then ultimately to Egypt, and then from Egypt to, to Greece, from Greece to Rome, from Rome to, to the French and to the, to the northern, to the, eventually to the, English who went around in, uh, and uh, the English and the Spanish went around in the Americas 
planting grapes everywhere. And it wasn't until much later until they got to California that they actually found a, 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 a terroir, a region that could grow grapes relatively well. It's, it's, it's amazing what a new discovery it was. And then watching this course of, of, of wine <laughs> follow the civilization, develop, development of civilizations. Uh, but, you know, one of the one of the biggest, I don't know, examples of this that I uh, find interesting is when, um, you know, Noah, Noah's Ark <laughs> landed on uh, Mount Ararat. The first thing he did, the first thing to reestablish civilization was to plant a vineyard and, and grow <laughs> grapes and, and drink wine and get drunk and pass out. <laughs> and then he, he so, knew man was reestablished. Yeah, right, exactly. <clears throat> the order was reestablished. I think the, uh, the way of how, what we was saying about how grapes have been spread and you were asking specifically of Malbec across the the world, Argentina is very particular because it had lots of migration. You had Italian migration, you had Spanish migration, and then you had uh, the religious migrant from the Spanish coming from the north uh, through all the Inca valleys. And, and, and then they found in there one of the conditions that is perfect for growing grapes. And it was irrigation from all these... Oh, yeah. uh, civilizations previous to like to Spaniards so they actually already had like a, pretty much the crops set up for them to be able to to get their their wine for their mass or whatever they were doing with it at the, at the moment but it was one of the reasons how these uh, uh, like Malbec was getting into Argentina was thanks to the priests and then we have we've connected directly to the one of the our wine wakers we we work together, which is the, the Davalos family that goes how many generations, maybe five or six generations of winemaking. I think. And it's on that he's, I was, a, I think it was his Doña Ascension, I think it's the, the woman who brought some uh, grapevines from, from France and, he, and she planted them. She was a miner. She was, a, she owned a few mining. Uh, she was mining, so what was she doing yeah, exactly? In, in but, northern Argentina. In the north of Argentina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she, yeah, she, she, you know, this is in the 1830s, by the way. And so this woman, woman Donna Ascension, essentially fa founded the Argentine winemaking industry in the, <laughs> in north, the north, yeah. north of Argentina, which is not well known. You know, people think uh, winemaking started in Mendoza and the, in the south. Uh, but it, it, it really didn't at first, uh, was in the, in the North of Argentina and, uh, on this same, the same tract of land where the first winery in Argentina was founded is where, uh, my family's cattle ranch is and where we, you know, discovered this wine ourselves. It's, it's, it's on the same, <laughs> the same, uh, uh, piece of land and it's where, you know, we make, uh, wine with this, this same founding family in the, in the same area. And so these are, these are uh, uh, grapes grown at over 8,000 feet and in uh, and, and elevation. And so the, the Malbec is, is able to produce a very thick skin to protect itself from the extreme uh, altitude uh, uh, conditions. Uh, and it's in this skin that develops these very rich tannins and resveratrol and flavonoids that are so good for you. Um, and so it's a, it's a very, it's these grapes clinging to the edge of survival <laughs> that, uh, and, and just that their ability to produce this thick skin. And these grapes tend to be very small, you know, when they, you pick them. And it also produces a very low yield at high, uh, uh, really high elevations relative to, to lower elevations. Uh, so everything <laughs> converges in a, in a perfect balance of survival to to make this this grape and and uh, it's uh, it's very unusual it's an unusual thing uh, you know to be able to make wine in the middle of the desert at over <laughs> eight thousand feet altitude uh, it's only in this 
region uh, in the world. So it's it's actually a very special place, which you know not not many people know about. I didn't know anything about it until we until we went there in you know being involved in real estate. We stumbled upon a little hobby vineyard on the land and didn't yeah. think much of it. But when we tried the wine that the made, neighbors made, we thought, oh, this yeah. is something interesting. This is something special. Yeah, I've been to the ranch and, and that the little plot is, is kind of small. And, and the, uh, the stone wall that goes around it is um, it's like 100 years old. Right. And the, the vines themselves are over 100 years old. Yeah. I, I, we went into that little plot. It's like a hundred by a hundred, maybe, right? And uh, and there was just bunches of grapes hanging down, and you could just pull them off the uh, off the vine, and and they taste great we, even without turning them into wine. Yeah, it's pretty exactly. amazing that it exists where it does because it's like there is um, there is irrigation that's been maintained by the families in the valley for what hundreds of years. Yeah, that, uh, that, snow, that snow melt from the upper Andes that yeah. comes down, and they've got to be really careful about how they use it because <laughs> that yeah. water is so precious because it barely ever rains. Yeah, um, and then uh, just below you in the valley is uh, is Hess, right? The Hess family. Right. They're they uh, they're a Swiss family that um, m made most of their money in Napa Valley, but then opened up this uh, vineyard in. Um, in uh it's the Chilaki Valley, right? Calchaki, yes. Calchaki. Yeah, I get that wrong every time. Um we uh they they have an interesting uh plot and they have a, a very odd um modern art museum. <laughs> yeah in the middle of the desert you go in there and you're like what? <laughs> yeah it's yeah. like an extreme like light light exhibits. Yeah. Kind of looks like a wall, but then you can walk through it. And uh, Diego and I have, have gone through it together. It's pretty, it's really neat, but it is in the middle of very the bizarre. And that's the meeting. Yeah. Since the uh, ranch is so remote, that's the meeting point from people that are coming up from Salta, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's the last. That, that's the last spot that is like fully furnished, all working, a yeah. nice pool. Then you go a little bit up, and then you're off on. You're in the desert. More on the desert, yeah. That's the museum of James Turrell. Uh, he's known for for working with light. So yeah, yeah. Like if if no one is like if some of the listeners are, you can Google him. But what he really does is like he like he removes your shadows type of it. He he works so well in the light. So when you walk in, you don't know where you're standing. You lose your sense of perception. It's a it's very interesting. Yeah, especially after a couple of glasses of Malbec. <laughs> yeah, because you have lunch in there and then you go in. Yeah, and, uh, it's so, very interesting too because it's so remote that um, when I met your father, Will, um, they waited for a day for us to get there because um, there was heavy rains in the mountains and all the rivers had uh, flash flooding. So there were two rivers that we had to wait for the water to subside before crossing. And that took us, uh, we were coming up from Capajate and it took us, it took us like nine hours to get just to, to the Hess family uh, winery. <laughs> yeah, you have a good it's story with that wheel. You go beyond into the desert and it's another, what, hour and a half? Yeah. Yeah, up into the valley. Yeah, yeah. it's a pretty fun experience. That's a, dang, that's a dangerous time of year because we use those, those arroyos, those riverbeds, you know, to, as roads up there. Uh, and you know, suddenly <laughs> you see a little stream start to come in, you know, down by the uh -oh. wheels, and then suddenly it turns into you see like raging water headed your way, and you got to get Stunks. the hell out of there <laughs> to, to not be washed away. Yeah. Um, uh, there is. I, I just wanted to get your opinion on this. If you're headed back from from the Ch Calchaqui, did I say right? Calchaqui. Kalchaki, yeah. uh, I'm gonna get it. Kalchaki, uh, if you're headed back, there's a long, you get sort of to the edge of a, like a mesa, and then there's a long winding switchback road that goes down into the valley. It's like how you mm -hmm. get, that is an amazing, that's one of the most amazing um, scenery or like views that I've seen in traveling on six different continents. It's really amazing. I, I think and it, it, when uh, when it was being explained to us how you get there and what it's going to look like, 
It was way underplayed. We got there and we're like, what? This is like a national treasure for sure. Yeah. It's amazing to me too, when you go from the climate of Salta around Salta City, which is almost like a jungle, and then you head up that road that you're talking about. And it- Alto de Obispo is called, just so. Yeah. It, it takes you up into the clouds. And so you suddenly, you're, you're in this kind of jungle, uh, 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 you know, the climate, it's like steamy and, and there's palm trees. Tropical, and yeah. And then it's tropical. And then you, you, you're going up and up and up. And then you get in the clouds. You can't see anything. You can't see <laughs> trucks coming the other way on the tiny, you know, uh, road. Tiny road, yeah. And, uh, you, know, our, my, you know, my family, my brother, my dad have all gotten to like minor car accidents because you can't see anything coming around a, a, a yeah. curve there. And you go and then you can't see anything in the, up in the clouds. And you drive, you know, for, I don't know, at least an hour and a half, two hours until you pop out up into this high altitude desert, which is a totally different <laughs> landscape. Also, yeah. and it's so dramatic. And you have and also at like 14,000 feet in elevation yeah. and overlooking, you know, that, that whole area at the top of the mesa there. It's, it's really. Yeah. The so fauna cool. changes, everything. And like, and you start seeing flying condors. Remember we were yeah, and, and you have like and you're like wow this is, it's completely different and and then you are different animals you're gonna have their guanacos that are usually the ones that cause accidents they are like the deers of Salta, um, so oh, but it's a, it's a very nice and then you end up in a desert again like and then you go to the, the uh, Cardones National Park that it's all those red mountains. That you may see in Salta, and they're like, look, you end up like you feel like you're in Arizona or the Grand Canyon type of that type of color with huge uh, mountains ahead. That, it's beautiful. The valley that the the ranch is in doesn't that end at the Continental Divide, and on the other side is Chile. Yeah, we share. I think it's shared some of the of the Andes mountains in there. Yeah. Yeah, and it's we're a not very interesting place to grow. Not one. that far from the Bolivian border either, to the north. Yeah, it's very interesting because you end up having salt mines in there. You have uh, tobacco fields in the in the, the tropical climate of Salta, and then you have these uh, vines growing in the extreme altitude. It's it's very very nice. It makes very different microclimates depending on where you, depending on the altitude. And there's uh, the, also the well, most well-preserved uh, mummy in the world. In oh, time. yeah. Three kids. <laughs> yeah, three kids. Yeah. That's how, that, and they were preserved because it was such extreme altitude where they were buried. Yeah. They were almost frozen. And then they discovered them, I don't know, I think 14,000 feet uh, or higher. I think it was even like 20,000 feet. So uh, it's yeah. like a much more story behind them on how they were buried, but. Yeah, they're super well preserved. You can see the lies of the kids yeah. uh, when they're in the inside the museum. But it's a it's a big, it's a fantastic region. Um, when Will was like one of the things that was Will saying about France and Argentina compared, he's like Argentina, the Malbec adapted so well because in in so so central France in Cahors, you can have like two thousand five hundred hours of sun a year. Well, in, in, in Salta, you can be having 3,500. So that helps that the ripeness of the fruit is, is completely different. And that's just a start. And what he was saying about the, the thickness of the skin, how it contracts, like it, the, the temperature change during the day, it's, it's, it's extreme, 70, it's very high between the- uh, Thermal yeah. amplitude, it's just massive. Great. And that causes that the plant is, uh, the grape, it's uh, expanding and contracting every day. And that, and that makes it less big, like, a, like other, it's not a big fruit, but it's very concentrated and very thick skins, which is the most important thing in wine. And that's why Malbec itself thrives up there, but something like Cabernet or yeah. uh, say like a Burgundy, doesn't do as well because it's thinner, right? It's thinner. And one of the things is that like you can, it, when you say Cabernet, what Cabernet offers you is like a longer finish. 
on right. your mouth. But when the Malbec is just fresh fruit and it's, it's just like short and it's it's very floral, it's very nice, very lots of red fruits in it. It, it just makes it a little bit easier also to drink. Yeah, well, I like it. Let's, get, let's uh, shift, shift gears a little bit. And can we just talk a little bit about the science of wine? And then I want to get into um, Diego's vocation of ex- being a wine explorer. <laughs> but let's talk about the, just the science of wine. We're talking a little bit about why Mal- Malbec thrives in, in the high altitudes. Um, what, like, I know that the terroir in France is, a, is an important thing. Maybe just explain what terroir is how the, the, like the Bordeaux grapes are grown mm-hmm. and then so to, what, well, just, and then what happens when they go into the winery? So terroirs are the different locations where grapes are grown. So when they say, okay, I have a terroir in France or I have a terroir in Argentina, it all varies depending on what type of soils you have. You can have calcaceous soils, you can have alluvial soils, and they are all different type of, of like pretty much sandy very type of desertic type of, of soil you're looking that grapes usually grow in very rough areas and, and since they need to thrive they produce better juices and better the plant is completely different depending on, on what are the characteristics they grow a terrace in argentina may vary depending on what uh, sand they have but you're also then adding to a different part uh, is the altitudes and the conditions I was mentioning before. The sun is very important, how exposure, uh, how much exposure do they have? Are they side next to a mountain? Do they receive the sun in the morning? Do they receive the sun in the afternoon? Do they receive it all day? All those kind of things produce different type of, of fruits or grapes for uh, for the wines. So that makes different uh, variations. You may be it's more common now to start seeing uh, bottles of wine that say single vineyard lot X or 52, lot uh, 29, because winemakers have discovered that different, even in the same terrain, different lots produce different type of, of, of grapes. So the terrain, when everyone says like, oh, I like the terrain, you can taste the mineral- minerality in here. It's because they're looking for that type of soil. They know where it's coming from. And those characteristics pass into the grape and into the into the wine. Uh, one of the you know, when you say about the science and how the the grapes are transformed in the into into making wine, one of the things that that Argentina prides now these days is that they have very little intervention. The conditions are so well. Uh, suited in in some of the spots in Argentina, especially in the Salta region, that the vineyards don't need. They're so they're so high in altitude that there are no insects, or there are no no. They don't have to use pesticides. The the weeds are very little, uh, so it's very clean uh, type of of production. And when they have a good product, they don't just have to sit down and start the fermentation, which is quite complicated, but it, it happens naturally. It's just fermenting wine, putting in a little bit of yeast if it's needed, or they can just occur naturally as expected. But after the grapes are picked, uh, they're just put into barrels of, of stainless steel barrels uh, or tanks. And then, then they start the fermentation process. These days it's very minimal intervention and they just drop the grapes, even with the stems, with the skins and everything and let it there sit with the mosto, which is the skin of the grapes. And then that's that's when they start getting all the tannins, all the flavors, all the color. And people think that white wine, it's, it's because it's sort of like green grapes or white grapes, but it's not that. It's actually how much exposure do they have to the skin. Um, so when that, pro- when, when the, when all the berries of the, of the, all the grapes are put in, in into the tanks. What you just have to wait is the fermentation, and it's usually a natural process uh, where the enzymes or the yeast that are single cell organisms start consuming the sugars of all these grapes, and they produce ethanol, uh, carbon dioxide, and uh, what was the third one? Ah, and they generate temperature. So those are three things that happen at the same time. 
when fermentation occurs. And it stops automatically because the enzymes, it stops by itself because enzymes cannot continue eating. There's no more sugar to produce alcohol and that's where it stops. Yeah. And <laughs> Diego, could I just pause you there? We can edit this. Yeah. Somebody is rapidly pounding on my door. Hold on. Oh, okay. Ooh, alcohol. Yeah, fermentation. Will when was the last time you understood fermentation? Yeah, I've been trying to understand it better. <laughs> it's complex. <laughs> it is complex. The change of the, and and I think one of the nicest thing of of fermentation is that it has been with us forever, but now we just start playing a little bit more with it in terms of temperature controls or just recently, uh, for the benefit of wine. So that's, yeah. that's good. Yeah, and that's a big, yeah, you know, I told you, I was talking to Bill Nuttall about this, about the process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he really, uh, you know, he, he thinks a lot of like, yeah, temper, temperature control and things, regulating acidity, especially from Sultanian mm -hmm. wines is just really a big, big deal, you know. Uh, and so I found that, found that pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, but that's, but I think that's the key process of modern. Can we, uh, can we start it again? Sorry about that. You know what was that? Yeah. Like? A case of what? wine. Oh. <laughs> perfect now we time. understand why. why that's why, so the, uh, that's why the guy was knocking so loud because I had to sign for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he said, was it wine from us or from someone else? It's actually um, when I founded Consilience, I was mm -hmm. looking online to see if um, if anybody had copyrighted the name or whatever. And the first thing that popped up was Consilience Wines. And um, there, there's a, uh, a vineyard and a winery in Santa Barbara that has a whole line of Consilience Reds and Whites. Oh. Um, I, I joined their wine club and, and like, Probably every two months, I get a case from them. Oh. And then, I, then I hand them out because it's the name of our company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I pretend like, you know, we, we're in partnership or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys were, um, were just talking about this while I was answering the door. Um, <clears throat> the difference between the sort of traditional um, method of making wine, which uh, Diego, you were talking about the fermentation process and all mm -hmm. that. In California, they do a different thing, which is they, they do a lot of blends and they go for the same flavor for every bottle that they, like year over year. How is that process different? Like, well, how do they make wine in that, in that way to, to achieve a particular flavor versus um, being more dependent on the weather that year or, or the, um, you know, the, the terroir and all that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously Napa is a, a good place to grow wine, but then they blend it. You yeah. Know, it's, it's like they well, have I, to achieve. I think it's part of the culture of America also. Being able to industrialize something and being able to replicate it multiple times and, and as, as a process of being proud that they were very good at making wine. Uh, it's something that America has achieved very well. And you see, and we were just talking with our, because we were talking to a wine producer not very long ago when we went visit Napa, maybe two months ago. And he was explaining to Will that it's about being regular, being constant, being have the same temperatures in, in your tanks, having all these little things that even changing a valve will make a difference how the oxygen affects uh, transferring wine from a tank to a barrel to a bottle. Uh, but Argentina, I think Argentina went through a few phases. Argentina went through the phase of immigrant wine. That is just the necessity of the Italians and Spanish wine to have wine. Then they started discovering that they can produce bulk wine. They can produce wine. Then they had the military dictatorship that crashed a lot of uh, wine uh, vineyards. And then they were just producing wine, cheap wine. And they were trying to produce wine as with the same conditions of, of Europe, 
like, oh, we're going to make Argentine wines with the same characteristics of Burgundy or, or Italy or and instead of knowing what fruit they were having or what grapes they were having, they were just trying to replicate a method. And someone came and told them, hey, no, no, you're, you're wasting your time. You have to actually work with what you have and make your own, um, not an own method because it's pretty much the same, but you have to work with what you have. And that's what they started doing. And now we're starting hurting to see a boom of wines of Argentina that talk about an expression of the country of a terroir of a region, even the winemakers. We will have, uh, last year we had a collection with, I was just, I'll tell you about, I was doing a wine tasting this Sunday, this weekend. And I was like, I was saying like, these guys are not very far from each other. And the bottles of Malbec being the same Malbec, they change, they taste completely different. And I was like, this is amazing. You guys are finally working out uh, different expressions, different one making decides when is the right ripeness to pick their grape, when, how they want to blend it. Uh, and that's something you were saying that our, uh, California is very good at blending things. Argentina is trying to do now very sing, uh, single uh, vineyard, single, only one varietal type of grapes. You'll see blends, but it's, they're very, their core is like only uh, doing a single varietal uh, wines. Yeah, I noticed too that um, the, the market for Malbec has exploded because um, even say five years ago, you would, could walk into a bar or a liquor store uh, or a wine merchant in Baltimore mm -hmm. and a lot of them just didn't carry Malbec or you could order it. And some, you know, sometimes the waitress, like if you're having dinner, would say, what's that? I mean, that was, that was pretty common about the time that I visited yeah. Spanish because I, you know, I fell in love with Malbec when I was down there, but I couldn't find it for the longest time. Now there's like three or four different sort of national brands uh, here in the U.S., which is it's great. And it's, it was interesting to see just kind of an expose, uh, explosion of interest in it. And I think that goes in, in tandem with what you're saying, Diego, that the... Uh, that it started taking on a characteristic of, it, of its own. Yeah. And it actually, I mean, that's probably true of any wine region in the world that once they sort of discover what they're all about, that's when uh, it becomes mm -hmm. interesting. You were mentioning Penfolds from Australia. Yeah. Same thing happened with Australian wines. It used to be that you couldn't find them anywhere. And then they figured <laughs> out how to ship them to the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> arrive in one piece and then it became kind of hip to be drinking Australian wines. Yeah. But I think that was also what triggered Will to start this, uh, this club, this partnership. Because when he, after you, you can tell your story, but when you were living in Argentina, you couldn't find the wines in here later, right? Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I mean, I, I lived there for three years and when I, you know, I developed such a taste for it, but, but of course, in the beginning, the taste I developed was for, you know, Mendoza Malbec. I didn't know about uh, the, the wines from Salta until a little later. And you'll find that once you, once you develop a taste for the Salta Malbec, you, you can't really go back to Mendoza or not too much because the, the Salta has that extra kick. It's got that extra oomph from the, you know, extreme sun and mm -hmm. uh, altitude conditions but anyway but you couldn't find as far as we knew I, I i mean you couldn't find wine from salta anywhere and uh especially not the you know the type that uh we were we were growing uh so diego you know working with you 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 figured out how to how to get the get the wine in a truck over the andes mountains to a port in chile and then up the pacific coast and then <laughs> to, uh, San yeah, it's and then uh, eventually to us and <laughs> The full journey, yeah. It started very little, but now it's uh, it's it's nice to be able to to work with these small wine producers because, as as we said, like Salta produces four percent of the wine of Argentina, only four percent. The rest comes from uh, from Mendoza, and Mendoza it's, it's very convenient for them because they have the from they just cross the border with Chile and the, that's it. But Salta, it's it's a few. I think it's a day, an overnight journey between the mountains, you're crossing deserts, get flat tires, 
trucks don't want to go and pick up the wine at the winery. So you it's like it's it's a full journey and and trying to figure out every single step and guaranteeing that the that the bottles survive. Yeah. It's like just thinking that you have to bring up you break more bottles, bring them up that coming down full. So it's all you have to think of all those conditions, how to get corks that corks don't are importation laws in Argentina. There's only one print out, like one print um, machine in the city. So everyone, when, when it's time to produce, everyone is queuing to print their labels. So you have to work out all these small region business to be able to scale it, to be able to bring it to the, to the US. And even with that, it's still hard. It's hard to compete. <laughs> Well, it, 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 so I should be grateful when uh, when the box arrives on my doorstep. <laughs> yes, you should. Yeah, <laughs> it's a miracle, especially yeah. you know the state of you know global shipping now. You know we've yeah. had you know just ridiculous situation. We had our wines on a on a, a barge off of off the shore in um, Oakland, off the port of Oakland for three weeks or something. Diego, I mean it's really yeah. really crazy yeah. time. There were no dock workers, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, everything so, combines. Yeah. yeah. And it's always difficult, you know, under normal circumstances, it, it's very tricky to, you know, to be in the wine business in Northern Argentina and get that wine to, to Americans at home. But the reason why it's, why we do that is because it truly is, as Diego was saying in the winemaking process that they've, uh, they've embraced there, you know, they are really, you know, determined to express the terroir to, you know, to have the wine be really authentic to the exact place where it came from. And places at, you know, these, these elevations and these conditions, they only exist here. And, and that's why, you know, bringing wine that tastes just like that place there, being able to taste that for me, you know, living in South Florida, you know, there's, there's no, there's no mountain, no elevation for hundreds of miles, but I can have that. I can experience this, you know, this totally opposite place in the wine and be able to experience it authentically because they use, for instance, they use indigenous yeast. They use the, the yeast that develops naturally on the skin of the grape to produce the wine. And that, that has a number of uh, effects. Uh, that you wouldn't get, uh, in, especially like uh, using up all the sugar naturally. So you get a wine that's mm -hmm. low, or, low or no sugar versus a wine from, you know, a more industrial wine from California that may, you know, has tons of added sugar. Uh, the other thing they do, it, you know, a wine from uh, Northern Argentina, you know, because of the extreme conditions creates a really robust uh, complex uh, 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 flavor on the on the palate. So if you can't get that from a you know a, a Central Coast California wine, you just add uh, something called Mega Purple, and it's a it's a great concentrate uh, that plumps up the wine and sweetens the wine. It solves all their all the problems. And so they have a, do a ton of little tricks like this. But then if you're drinking that, I mean, it's just like it's just like a soda. It's not uh, it's not representative of any terroir anywhere, and they can produce you know a million gallons of it at any any time they want, and so that's a totally different thing than than what we're doing. And uh, so anyway, that that's why I feel it's important what we're doing to let people you know experience a truly special, unique terroir in this wine they're drinking. And uh, you know I think that I think it's like more important than ever. You know, when you're thinking about a, a post-pandemic or or, uh, <laughs> or just a pandemic situation where you know you're at home, you can't you can't travel uh, as much as you would like to, and so to have an authentic experience with a with a wine that is from <laughs> from a very a special place, I think is you know it's it's really uh, it, it, it's a it's a truly you know unique special occasion to be, you know, experiencing this place through your taste buds instead of just drinking a, you know, a grape soda, essentially, uh, with, you know, most of the wines that you get off the shelf at, you know, your grocery store, something like 95% of them have this, they use this mega purple in them. And so it, you know, it's really hard to find an authentic experience just, you know, at the grocery store or down at your wine shop. And so, 
Um, you know, that's why we, you know, we want to share these wines with as many people as possible. And, you know, if anyone's interested, they can go to extremealtitudewine.com to see our offerings of, uh, of uh, Kalchaki Malbecs. Um, it's right, pointing out too that the partnership it, it doesn't just simply focus on Malbecs. Um, you've sent out some Italian wines and even yeah. some from uh, California, but the approach is still the same, right? You're still looking for well, small well, vineyards that are producing authentic products. Yes. So you know, we came, we started in Argentina, and we realized that this this authenticity, uh, you know, truly does create a, it creates a better experience. And we realized that that philosophy is carried on, you know, in a, in a number of wine regions uh, around the world. And so we we work with a, an importer. And before he was involved with us, he he worked to bring um, wine back for American travelers in Europe or, or around the world. So you would be on your honeymoon in Italy or or somewhere in, you know, visiting uh, uh, chateaus and, wine and uh, wineries in France, and then his service would bring the wine back for you. Uh, and so that caused him to, to develop an intimate knowledge with, you know, winemakers and special terroirs uh, that, you know, people who went there would get legitimately excited about and want to, you know, experience that again. Uh, and so he helped us, you know, identify these, these other places around the world, um, especially, especially like in the Mediterranean where, it, you know, has you know, such a long history of winemaking, uh, you, you know, you can find, you know, really interesting things if you, if you know where to look and you've got somebody to guide you. <laughs> yeah. so thankfully we have. Yes. And, so what, and one of the. What regions have you covered so far? I know I've gotten Italian, French and uh, California wines from you guys. We have covered, we did Argentina, Italy, France, Spain. Spain. Then we did US. I know we did Australia, New Zealand. We have done US. Uh, then we did Mediterranean. Uh, and we've done it again, Italy. What we find out is that at the end of the day, the, we can try to bring from many different places, but it's also a lot of hard work. Uh, just to bring a small producer because we have a lot of bureaucratic uh, things to do for, it, for to import wine into the U.S. Mm. But uh, seeing that we can express regions with uh, six bottles of wine, which is like the uh, wine collection every quarter that we have, and then we just go rotating, it's very, it's very satisfying because you're able to show a little bit of everything it comes with a booklet, it will tell you the story. An important thing of drinking wine is being able to set himself in a context. If you're drinking a bottle of wine without knowing anything about it or where it comes from or what are you expecting from it, it will get you like, you, you won't able to root it somewhere unless you have lots of knowledge around it. So what we try to do is put you into context before you open your bottle of wine, being able to tell you a little bit of the winemaker, um, and just make your, your experience a little bit easier and more enjoyable because at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want to be able to bring wines that people want to enjoy, that it's hard to put yourself. You really struggle sometimes going to a, a wine store and then just sitting in front of it and they have, what, I don't know, 500 labels. And where do you choose? So, so, so where the, uh, the title Wine Explorer comes in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you go and or visit a different... I guess not during the pandemic, but are, have you been able to go and visit a lot of the regions? Yeah, I, I before even before even I started with working with the club, I was always a big. I really enjoyed drinking wine, so I've had already been to New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, France. Uh, I've been doing a little bit more when I joined the club. I did a little bit more, like going to the carcasses, uh, going to Slovakia look into those roots of, of wine because they have a lot of history, but trying to expose those little wine producer or known grapes, uh, it's very hard. You have to tell a lot of a story. So my, my point is in there, try to find points of connection and being able to bring those, how to root or an idea or a story or something from, a, from, a, from the terroir or the place it comes from to be able to explain it to the 
to the people in the club. But yeah, traveling is part of it. Not in the pandemic, but yeah, yeah, kind <laughs> when of when it's possible. Um, so you mentioned the six bottles of wine to express the region that from which they come. Mm -hmm. um, that is uh, sort of like the introductory level of the way the club works. Maybe you could just kind of explain, like you could give the website again, Will, and, uh, and explain kind of how the process works for anyone who's interested in subscribing or becoming a member of the partnership. Um, just kind of explain how it works, and then also the uh, the additional wines that you have available. You're still sourcing uh, packages um, from other places that you can that uh, members can buy. Yeah. Uh, well, the the URL is extremealtitudewine.com, and uh, the, the the club the the main. Um, Flagship club is yeah six bo six bottles quarterly, uh, but we do we do have some different levels uh, for for just Argentine wines. Um, we have some some three bottle collections that are more um, uh, introductory, um, but then the the six bottle club is the is the flagship. So that's six bottle six new bottles quarterly. We start we typically start in Argentina and then uh, there'll be a different different region each each quarter yeah so so for example right now we're about to release maybe it's uh, news to everyone but we, <laughs> the spain is coming up in october but then again in january we have argentina okay uh, which is coming up again so anyone that subscribes in these days or in these months they can uh, decide if they want argentina or if they want spanish wines and then we can, uh, and then Argentina again. So it's, it's a good, the, the experience of, uh, if you're very into, for example, trying uh, Argentine wines, this is a great moment to do it. Yeah. This one that I'm drinking here is a Rioja from your club. Oh, I'm from Spain. Yeah. I dug into the uh, fridge just for this conversation. Uh, <laughs> good. I was actually drinking some uh, wine from Italy from the mountains of Etna volcano. Mm. That's interesting. Very nice, very fresh. Well, it's a good good thing to have during the pandemic. You, instead of having to travel and go taste things from individual wines, you ship them and they all come to me. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I'm, I think it's uh, people are sometimes a little bit afraid of jumping into wines, but I think if you the only way of drink, learning about wines is actually drinking. Yes. So, uh, this is part. this is actually a, <laughs> yeah that's the hard part, but it's a it's a good way to expand your horizons of wine. If you go sometimes, what what we have seen is that when you they go again to a restaurant, they have one bottle in the collection, maybe a grape or a brand they recognize, and they go to a restaurant. At least now they know they like that wine. Yeah. So uh, that's a that's a good good thing to have when they give you a two hundred bottle menu of wine. You're like, eh, where do I start? That's great. Cool. All right. Uh, that so, web website again is High Altitude Wines. Um, thank no, Extreme Altitude Wine. Oh, Extreme. Excuse me. Extreme Altitude Wines. Uh, there you'll find the, uh, the flagship uh, membership, um, which is six bottles every quarter from a different region in the world. It's very interesting and it's always fun to um, open the box, find out. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you, Will and Diego. Uh, this is interesting. I, I like talking about wine. I like drinking wine. I like learning about it. So, so that's uh, you know that's this has been this has been good. And I'll maybe after the Riojas uh, or the Spanish wines, I'll get you guys back up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, Next time we can do it. We can do it all together in a room, sharing the same glass. Soon, right? Yeah, hopefully. Get rid of that Delta variant and we'll... Uh, <laughs> Good traveling. Okay, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Guys. Bye. Bye.